Hello and welcome to episode 117 of the official EstablishedRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan. I'm one of the co-founders here at ETR. As always, I am joined by fellow co-founder Evan Silva. And today we are going team by team through each NFL franchise, talking about important week four takeaways, waiver wire guys, role changes, tilt, anything else. Evan, what's going on? What's going on? Good start to the season long season. Uh, we have a football guys championship team that is in the top 150 and is 4-0. Uh, I also have a main event team with uh, some buddies uh, from back home in St. Louis, and we are number three overall out of 2,520 uh, in the FFPC main event. So off to a hot start. Hopefully we're not peaking too soon. Um, there have been a ton of injuries across the league as we will get to on the show. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, we actually needed Robert Tanya last night to score like 20 and uh, and he did. So maybe Kittle to the rescue. We'll talk about him. We get to Green Bay portion of this program. Reminder that this podcast is, of course, free that you are listening to. The AFC version is premium. The Friday night show with Evan and I and Wiggins talking DFS slate breakdown is premium. The Saturday GPP show with Dink and Leone, which is just so crushing so hard. Those guys are winning so much and they're doing such a good job with the Saturday show. That is premium also, and on Sunday, Evan and I, right before lock, as always, on the last minute live stream. If you have not signed up for the site yet, we do have weekly options. We do have monthly options up. Access all our projections, the shows, the top plays, Silva's matchups, all my DFS stuff, everything you need, everything we think you need to win at both season long and DFS. Okay, let's get to it with the NFC, and I want to start with Kenyon Drake because I mean, people are like ready to cut this guy. And what's shocking to me is that Kenyon Drake just has five targets on 144 Kyler Murray pass attempts. I mean, I couldn't have dreamed that up in a million different scenarios before the season. He did have an injury late. Cliff Kinsbury said that he's going to be fine. So I don't think it's a big factor. But man, I mean, I know you said it before, Evan. Chase Edmonds is probably the better back here, but they're not letting him play. They're just like using Kenyon Drake, not using him in the pass game. Kyler scores the goal line touchdowns. What should people be doing with Kenyon Drake right now? I mean, I know it's been really, really frustrating. And the offense as a whole has been frustrating, not just the running game, which was the strength of the offense last season, but also the passing game. I mean, Kyler Murray's uh, efficiency is way, way down, even from last year, from his rookie season. And, um, you know, their offense is just throw a bunch of hitch routes to DeAndre Hopkins or let Kyler Murray run around. And that's it. They're getting nothing from Larry Fitzgerald. Andy Isabella is barely playing. Um, Christian Kirk has been in- injured. He did score a touchdown uh, last week, but hasn't made any big plays. And that's the role that they uh, enlisted him for this season. The thing is that their, their upcoming schedule remains extremely favorable. Um, they've got the Jets this week. They've got the Cowboys after that. They've got the Seahawks after that. They've got the Dolphins after that. The Bills could be a tough one, although their defense has underachieved this year. And then they've got the Seahawks again. So I think that Kenyon Drake is a buy low. Um, And I know that people don't want to hear that, but I think that you can, that his owners are so, so frustrated right now that you can get him for really, really cheap. He might even get dropped in some shallower 10 and 12 team season long leagues. Uh, But I think that he is likelier than not to pick it up. And I don't, and there have been no indications that they're going to start throwing the feature back job uh, chase Edmonds way. So um, I, I would be willing to pick him up off, like uh, on the cheap uh, because I don't think that he's going to maintain this rate of, you know, five uh, targets on, you know, almost 300 uh, dropbacks by Kyler Murray. I think, I think that they're going to have to get him more involved in the passing game because they are not getting production from anyone in the passing game other than um, DeAndre Hopkins. Yeah. I mean, they've given Larry Fitzgerald 236 snaps. He has 88 receiving yards on the season. I mean, I get it. He's a good guy. And, uh, allegedly, and 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 he's a great player. He's gonna be in the Hall of Fame. It's just it's just insane to me. You mentioned the schedule for Arizona, very soft. I believe they have Carolina coming up this week, not the Jets, but either way, really really soft schedule for Arizona coming up. Uh, let's go to Atlanta. They played last night. Julio goes down. Uh, you know, it, it was not pretty. I mean, Calvin Ridley had zero targets. Olamide Zacchaeus. Uh, was the direct backup to Julio. And he continues, Matt Ryan continues to pepper Russell Gage with targets. At this point, I feel like they have to give Julio a little bit of a break on that hamstring. It was reported at like halftime of the game 
that they said Julio was only going to play situ situationally anyways because his hamstring issue was so bad. So if he's out, you know, I'm always going to be interested in Atlanta pass catchers. It looks like Zacchaeus is the guy. Would you be adding him off waivers? And what do you think is going on with Atlanta after that ugly game last night? Yeah, I mean, it was it was really, really ugly. And it wasn't great uh, the week before either uh, for the Falcons offense. Um, Calvin Ridley went into that game banged up with an ankle. Uh, certainly the Packers were rolling coverage his way. He finished without a catch. Zacchaeus is the clear guy uh, that is playing in place of Julio Jones. And they're throwing him a lot of high percentage stuff too. It's not just, um, you know, what Julio would be doing running downfield routes. So uh, Zacchaeus is, is a factor all of a sudden. Um, and uh, Hayden Hurst, we saw get more involved uh, with six targets last night uh, in the Monday night game. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that expectations need to diminish a little bit for Atlanta uh, with Calvin Ridley and Julio Jones now banged up. Yeah, I misspoke before. You were right. Arizona plays the Jets this week. It's Atlanta that gets mm -hmm. uh, Carolina this week. So obviously very good uh, scoring environment there. We'll see. I'm interested in Zach. if he's going to play that direct Julio role, specifically as a punt play in DFS. I think, you know, if you look at waiver wire, we wouldn't expect Julio to miss that much time when you look at the rest of the season. Top 150, we wouldn't expect Julio to miss too much time. So you're going to not see that reflected there. Let's go to the aforementioned Carolina Panthers. I think it's really interesting what's going on with DJ Moore. Um, they've kind of changed his role, and, and his ADOT is actually longer than Robbie Anderson's. And Dink made a point this morning, like they brought in Robbie Anderson to play the DJ Moore role, and then they put DJ Moore out running more low percentage routes. I mean, Robbie Anderson is sixth among all NFL wide receivers in targets. I'm curious what you think about that as Robbie being the actual 1A guy now, not DJ Moore. And should we be thinking about him like that? Yeah. I mean, the, the Panthers have shown us how they want to employ these guys. Um, DJ Moore, though, you know, in his first couple of seasons, he was an elite run after catch receiver, but he is not getting those run after catch chances as much. Robbie Anderson is getting those run after catch chances. And DJ Moore is more of the downfield threat. Uh, the, the Panthers do play the Falcons twice, uh, I think within, within their next four games. And so I'm still definitely buying low on DJ Moore, but uh, I think that the expectation at this point should be that Robbie Anderson is going to be the highest scoring uh, fantasy receiver on the, on the, uh, the Panthers. Uh, Reggie Bonifon did get more involved last week uh, sort of at Mike Davis's expense, but Mike Davis was still a really strong fantasy play. And, and you, you nailed that, that Mike Davis was going to be like, a, you know, a fringe RB1 in Christian McCaffrey's absence. It looks like Christian McCaffrey is going to miss at least one more game. Uh, and again, the Panthers are playing the Falcons this week. The Falcons have been um, a clear pass funnel. They actually have played pretty good run defense, holding opposing RBs to 3.6 yards per carry, but giving up 8.5 yards for pass attempt uh, to quarterbacks. But they're giving up uh, running back receptions again in bunches. They've given up 34 catches to opposing RBs. And that's where Mike Davis can really, really shine. I saw Mike Davis get banged up a little bit and leave the game. And I think that's why Bonifon played so much. 61% of the running back carries went to Mike Davis. Again, I think that was a little bit injury induced. Mike Davis came back in the game and was fine. But yeah, you know, I joked around a lot about 90% CMC. You know, CMC is 10K on DraftKings. Mike Davis is around. 5k you know he was 4900 then he was 5700 and you know people are still skeptical on him. I mean Mike Davis is is proving that scheme is going to matter a ton um, and Mike Davis certainly a plus pass catcher in the NFL let's go to Chicago and the first thing I want to say about Chicago and, and what we saw week four is I think it's underrated how difficult a matchup is for teams to face the Colts like the Colts have a legit good defense but still Nick Foles was not great I will say from a usage perspective David Montgomery as Evan predicted last week I mean David Montgomery's usage error is pointing up through the roof without Tariq Cohen true workhorse now he's going to get some softer matchups coming up what do you think about what's going on with the Bears right now yeah 85 percent of the snaps last week for David Montgomery that's a career high um, so he's going I think the jury is still out on how good he is and you know the running game as a unit has been broken for the Bears, uh, but it does like look like he is going to be close to an every down back in Tariq Cohen's absence. I think that Darnell Mooney has become a pretty interesting player uh, for Chicago. Again, uh, set season highs in uh, playing time, 74% last week, saw nine targets. He's going to be an interesting uh, 
play on the uh, on the uh, showdown slate on Thursday night against Tampa Bay. He's the number two receiver now ahead of Anthony Miller. Um, and yeah, I mean, this is, this just isn't going to be an offense that I, I think scores a lot of touchdowns uh, this season. And so it isn't a great offense to invest in uh, as a unit, uh, but they are getting in the Allen Robinson has a has consecutive hundred yard games and it has looked matchup proof. Uh, but uh, this Thursday night game is going to tell us a lot about really how, uh, again, how they feel about Darnell Mooney, who, um, is playing a lot more than I think anybody, even the Bears themselves anticipated. You know, they signed Ted Ginn. Darnell Mooney is way out in front of Ted Ginn. Oh, yeah, for sure. Actually, looking forward to that Thursday game. Should be interesting. Uh, let's go to Dallas. And, you know, it's just happening every week where they get in these wild, wild shootouts. And Dak is on pace for 6,760 pass yards. A ton of that has been in straight comeback mode. And, you know, we said last week, well, we don't know if that's going to happen this week with Dak. You know, we don't know if, if the Browns can put pressure on Dak to have to throw the ball like a wild man again. Well, they did in part because this Dallas defense is so, so, so bad. So you see Dak having these outrageous numbers. You see, even though Dalton Schultz only is seeing 14.8% of the targets since Blake Jarwin went down, 14.8% of the targets in this Dallas offense is worth a ton. And then we saw CeeDee Lamb. It was good to see him back in his normal role last week. As expected, he kind of, uh, in week three, he got banged up on that punt return. He was back in full snaps in week four so yeah I mean this Dak thing is crazy I mean obviously Dak has chance to finish as the quarterback one do you think this defense can keep allowing Dak to have 40 50 attempts a game I do I do um it's that bad it's that bad in the secondary they're really missing Leighton Vander Ash in the middle of their defense you know their their defensive coordinator Mike Nolan had been out of football for several years he's Mike McCarthy's buddy back from in, in San Francisco like a decade and a half ago and you know they they just they lack a lot of continuity on defense I don't know if the game has passed by Mike Nolan but that was you know a clear uh, cronyism hire and they're kind of paying for that uh, defensively right now I wanted to mention Amari Cooper just mm -hmm. absolutely smashing second in the NFL in targets first in catches um, you know he's the number one overall uh, uh, scoring receiver in PPR leagues right now. And we, we got him at, at a major, major discount. We had him as the wide receiver six overall. And um, he, his, his ADP in high stakes leagues was wide receiver 13, wide receiver 14. He's been consistent, uh, which has been a knock on Amari Cooper throughout his career. Um, and he's been, you know, a, 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 a weak winner uh, through the, the first month of the season. Yeah, the, the loser has been Michael Gallup, right? And the reason that Amari Cooper's ADP, in part because of the inconsistency, but also because people were saying, well, hold on, how are we going to get Michael Gallup and CeeDee Lamb and Blake Jarwin and Ezekiel Elliott all their targets when uh, we also need Amari Cooper to get eight, nine, 10 targets a game if we're going to take him in round two or round three? The answer has been that Michael Gallup is running these low percentage, I think Daigle called them like coin flip routes, which I think is a good thing, a good description where he just runs up the sideline and hopes for the best. And so you're not going to get a lot of consistent production that way you're going to have some big spike games and so he's going to be in the air yards model and stuff like that but yeah I think Gallup has been the loser would you agree there as Amari's been the winner Gallup has kind of been the loser in terms of how they're being used absolutely Gallup running the, the lowest percentage toughest routes in the offense um, he is going to have spiked weeks though uh, it's just that he's going to be a boom bust wide receiver three on a weekly basis for sure okay let's go to Detroit and I thought this was disappointing from Detroit I had a bet on Detroit I think you had a bet on Detroit too they get up 14 nothing and then even with New Orleans down their top two corners no Michael Thomas no Jerry Cook no Andrews Pete uh, Detroit just completely falls apart and TJ Hawkinson uh, despite a really good matchup was not really involved Kenny Galladay uh, played well uh, in a reasonable setting no certainly no explosion and they continue to get absolutely nothing from Marvin Jones, what did you think out of Detroit's kind of collapse against the Saints? Yeah, it was very disappointing as someone that bet the Lions got out to that big lead and just blew it. Um, wound up not having the ball very much in the game, ran only um, like a little bit over 50 offensive plays, uh, whereas the, the Saints were up close to 70. Um, and so that really hurt the, the, the Lions from a, a, you know, a play volume, offensive volume standpoint. Um, DeAndre Swift did get back in the mix as the number two running back ahead of carry on Johnson, but Adrian Peterson continues to be their main back. Um, it's been a frustrating offense so far, uh, for Detroit for the most part. Yeah, really frustrating. Okay. 
uh, Green Bay. Uh, it was Robert Tanyan's season. As we mentioned at the top, people are calling him baby Kittle. You know, I think he was roommates with Kittle. They stayed and trained with Kittle for a while. Athleticism off the charts. So not your typical UDFA for Robert Tanyan. Now the question is for people on waiver wires, and I know a lot of sharp people probably already have Robert Tanyan. Shout out to us. But uh, if you don't, how much should you bid on Robert Tanyan? Because they have a buy this week, and then we'd expect Devonta Adams to be back, and maybe they get and Lazard back at some point. So how aggressive would you be on Robert Tanyan on waiver wires right now? I mean, I guess, I guess it depends on the format, but certainly if you're playing FFPC with the, uh, the extra points for tight end receptions, I would be very aggressive. Um, should have picked him up last week, uh, but he's probably still you know out there on 30 or 40% of waiver wires. He's a guy that, I mean, I think it's clear that Aaron Rodgers trusts, he's catching everything. Um, he caught every single target that he had in week uh, four or in week three, and then he did it again uh, in week four. Um, and so, and I think that he's becoming a guy that, that Aaron Rodgers trusts and, and is looking for. And even when Devontae Adams comes back, and I think that Alan Lazard is going to be out for a while, I think Robert Tanyan is, is going to be clearly, you know, the, the clear cut tight end for the Packers moving forward. MVS continues to be highly inconsistent. You know, they're trotting out Darius Shepard as their slot receiver. I think they're, especially at, with the way that Aaron Rodgers is playing right now, which is just absolutely lights out, doesn't even matter who his supporting cast is. Uh, I think that you, you want to be aggressive going after Robert Tanya where he's available. Yeah, and what we get in Packers Island games always is a lot of people wondering what the hell are they doing with Aaron Jones usage? And we've talked about this a ton. And, you know, I'm not sure it matters as much because they're using Aaron Jones in such a way that is so valuable, almost like Alvin Kamara. But there was an excessive amount of Jamal Williams uh, last night. And I know that people were tilting. If you listen to this podcast, though, you know that that is to be expected. And really, it doesn't affect Aaron Jones' value too, too much. You know, it's going to cap his ceiling a little bit, but he's still going to have some huge, huge games. So it's just more, a little bit more Jamal Williams than usual last night from what I saw. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, Aaron Jones still got his 20 touches. He still got his five receptions. He's uh, entering week four. He was leading the NFL in red zone targets, which is not usually something that you see from a running back. And then he scored another touchdown on a red zone target last night. So, yeah, yeah it, it can be a little frustrating to see Jamal Williams out there, especially when he's getting, you know, a goal line carry and getting stuffed on, on fourth and fourth and goal um, because that should have gone to Aaron Jones, you know. But, um, it, 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 again, we, we, we've talked about this before. It, it's also a way for the Packers to keep Aaron Jones healthy. As long as he's getting his 20 touches, his five catches, he's going to be absolutely fine. Top five uh, RB1 going forward. All right, speaking of running back usage, let's go to the Rams. And I think one of the things that tilted the DFS field the most this past week was Daryl Henderson's usage. And, you know, maybe we should have seen it coming a little bit more because Sean McVay, maybe a fake sharp. I mean, he, he loves Malcolm Brown. And we saw Malcolm Brown in week three play a ton of snaps. Now, Daryl Henderson dominated touches, but Malcolm Brown still played a ton. In this game, Daryl Henderson only saw 47% of the running back carries and only 14% of the running back targets. I retweeted a quote from McVay uh, last night and it was like a football guy quote. It was like, you know, we wanted to play physical and then we wanted to, uh, you know, mash it in there. And, and, and Malcolm Brown's the better guy for that, you know, and I didn't really expect that from McVay who I thought was more modern than like three yards in cloud of dust stuff. So what do you think this means for Daryl Henderson? I would note before you answer that Cam Akers is expected back in week five. And, and if, and if Daryl Henderson can't beat out Malcolm Brown, well, he's in big trouble when Cam Akers came back, comes back because Cam Akers was playing ahead of both of them. It looked like he was poised to play ahead of both of them. So what's going on with the Rams' backfield right now? The fact of the matter is that this is a week-to-week -week game, and things can change very, very quickly. Um, and Daryl Henderson goes from a guy who was looking at, you know, RB, like legit RB1 value over the previous two weeks to all of a sudden a guy that is going to be maybe a flex option uh, heading into week five. So um, you just kind of got to roll with the punches, you know, give what the team is telling you, take what the team is telling you. And the team is telling us that um, Daryl Henderson is going to be part of a committee, not, you know, a locked in lead back. Yeah, really, really tilting. I will say that the uh, Tyler Higby usage, as Evan talked about before the season is just, I mean, I, I, if you guys read the props article, I was on the under on Higby catches and it's just like a layup at this point because he's only running a route on like half of 
Jared Goff's dropbacks, and they're and then they're also one of the most run-heavy teams in the NFL. And so, you know, it's just a really bad setup right now for Tyler Higby. He's going to have some touchdown games, but um, volume is going to be a struggle for Tyler Higby. Minnesota, good news on on Minnesota, I think, is what we've seen from Justin Jefferson. Last two weeks, Justin Jefferson has ran 51 routes on 56 Kirk Cousins dropbacks for a 28% target share. Turn that into 11 278 one. I mean, Justin Jefferson looks like an elite. Uh, NFL baller in his second, basically his second NFL game already. I don't know if this is sustainable in an offense that's going to be team established run. By the way, shout out to Mike Zimmer, team established run. I don't know if you guys saw the picture of his alleged girlfriend in the New York Post, but uh, shout out to him. You established the run. This is, this is what happens uh, to you. But anyways, uh, what do you think about Justin Jefferson's long-term value going forward? Obviously, the spots that he's had the last couple of weeks have been very yeah. good. I would be willing to say that he's almost transformed this offense over the past two weeks. You know, you remember the, the Vikings started off really, really slow offensively last year too. And then they kind of got things together a little bit. And I think that they are trending in the right direction. Dalvin cook is, is still Dalvin cook. He's absolutely balling out right now. Um, and their schedule upcoming is pretty favorable. They, they get the Seahawks this week. And I think the highest total game, on the entire slate on Sunday night. Uh, then they get the Falcons. Uh, they get the Packers, which it, it could go either way. And then they get the Lions. The Bears will be a tough one, but then they get the Cowboys after that. So uh, I think that the, 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 the trajectory is upward right now uh, for the Vikings, uh, for Kirk Cousins. Justin Jefferson has caught 16 passes so far this year. Eight of them have gone for 20 or more yards. 10 of them have gone for 17 or more yards. And, and he's, he's helping Adam Thielen as well um, as a, a big play threat who's playing on the outside. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that he is here to stay as at worst an every week wide receiver three uh, and maybe a wide receiver two every week going forward. Why are they not using Irv Smith? I mean, I know we've, we don't spend a lot of time on this. I'm just tilting because he's on our FFPC team and they literally, he's like, those, he plays, but they don't even throw him the football. It's really tilting, but. Yeah, I, it's, it's tough to explain. He does play. I mean, he's playing like 60% of the snaps. They're just not throwing him the, the rock. I mean, he's, yeah. he's clearly like, I mean, he's lower than Kyle Rudolph in like the target pecking order. I know. Brutal. Okay. Uh, Saints, you know, I'm not sure there's a lot to take away from this Saints game other than it was impressive that they won missing so many pieces, but from a usage standpoint, I expect Michael Thomas back. I expect Jared Cook back at some point we will see. And like, you know, people complain about Alvin Kamara's game. You know, the guy still had 20 points Well, you know, a bad game for Alvin Kamara is, 20 points at this point. Anything from New Orleans in their win over Detroit? Uh, Drew Brees threw the ball down. He didn't throw the ball much in this game, but he threw the ball downfield a little bit more. Emmanuel Sanders picked up, picked it up after a slow start. Uh, Traquan Smith scored twice. Um, you know, I think Alvin Kamara is going to be fine. Obviously, I think every single week he's a top two running back uh, play. Um, I, I, I think it was a promising effort overall. And as you mentioned, they've got reinforcements coming. Um, they, we have not seen the, the peak of, of the Saints offense yet. We, and we'll, we'll get to that when Michael Thomas and Jared Cook are healthy. For sure. Okay, the Giants. Um, I tweeted about this. You tweeted about this. Evan Ingram is playing 90% of the snaps. You know, he's slaughter wide in about half of them. He leads the team in target share at 20%. His ADOT has been pathetic. But as we talked about before the season, their schedule is so brutal for the first month. Now they get Dallas. Washington, Philly, Tampa, Washington, Philly, Cincy, Seattle, Arizona. I mean, it's just like a dream setup for the Giants. And so maybe I've been too optimistic on Daniel Jones, but he is going to have spike weeks in these matches, maybe as soon as this week against Dallas. And Evan Ingram should be dragged along with Danny Dimes. So I'm optimistic on him. I know from your tweet that you're optimistic on him. Anything on Evan Ingram and the rest of the Giants? Yeah, Evan Ingram's usage has been excellent uh, with, you know, the exception of his A dot. He had a really low A dot last year too, though. And when he was out there, he was producing at a clear cut tight end one clip. Um, so I, I, I think that he's a buy low right now. If you're looking for tight end help um, be, because of those matchups that you, that you mentioned, I mean, th this game against Dallas, you know, this is going to be the Giants best opportunity by far of the season. And we knew that they were going to start slow offensively. This is going to be the best opportunity by far for Daniel Jones to have a, you know, a, a pop-up game and for Evan Ingram, the Cowboys have been, just been getting slaughtered by tight ends. Yeah. Okay. The Eagles. I, I, I mean, Eagles going to San Francisco and get it done with Travis Fulgham, uh, Greg Ward, 
uh, John Hightower, Richard Rogers. I, I was literally playing pickup basketball against Richard Rogers like eight months ago. And now he's playing like three quarters of the snaps for the Philadelphia Eagles. It's wild. Um, I, I think, uh, I mean, I can't say that anybody should pick up any of these guys. Maybe Greg Ward would be my favorite. I think a better question that people want answered is, is Zach Ertz completely washed? I mean, Zach Ertz has 139 yards on 29 targets this season. Really, really pathetic. He will turn 30 years old next month. The age model is spitting out, my proprietary age model is spitting out some serious warning signs on Zach Ertz. It might be too late. I mean, I included him in that poll and people were like, yeah, Zach Ertz is, is washed. So what do you think about Zach Ertz? Is it complete toast time? Tent time for Zach Ertz. He looks slow out there. That's for sure. I mean, he looks like he's running stuck in mud. Um, it's, it, it's, 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 he's a tough watch right now. <laughs> he should be getting like 10, 12, 13 I targets, know. you know, but like he, I mean, he has nothing after the catch. Not that he ever had much after the catch, but he's no. like totally done after the catch. No, I mean, the way that he's always made a living is being one of the best route running tight ends in the NFL. And I mean, he's not like, he doesn't even look crisp enough to, to be a great route runner anymore. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of not wash, I mean, let's go to San Francisco because Jarek McKinnon, I, I didn't, I mean, God, 92% of the snaps, 21 out of 25 running back touches, 17% target share for Jarek McKinnon. I didn't know he had this in him, given what he's been through with injuries in his career. However, we don't know about the status of uh, Raheem Mostert. We don't know about the status of Tevin Coleman. We will see. I would also note that Debo Samuel was back and he was eased in a little bit, 24 snaps, but I would expect that to rise pretty quickly, assuming he came out of that game healthy, which I think that he did. What do you see out of San Francisco in their loss to the Eagles on Sunday night? Yeah, I thought that after Jarek McKinnon banged his ribs in the previous game and they, they used him as a feature back until that happened, uh, they would get Jeffrey Wilson more involved. That was clearly not the case. Jarek McKinnon was a true every down back against Philadelphia. Now they got the Dolphins coming up. I think Jarek McKinnon is going to be a confident play um, across formats against um, uh, against Miami. Um, Kittle is just an absolute monster. Um, and then Debo Samuel was eased in, but I thought he looked good on his touches. Um, so I thought that was, a, that was a promising debut for Debo Samuel. Yeah. Brandon Ayuk also fun to watch, man. That guy's going to be good also. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just, just a stud after the catch. I yeah. mean, and that was the book on him coming out of Arizona State. And he, you know, he has looked apart so far. The Seattle Seahawks. And this one was expensive, man. I, I did not see the target share getting spread out this much. How does David Moore get four targets and Greg Olson seven and, and Freddie Swain three and Will Dusley two and DJ Dallas two and Travis Homer two. I mean, I'm sitting there with Tyler Lockett. You know, I, I was brutally, you know, trying to figure out this 2v2 with, Lockett and Beckham and two different quarterbacks and I ended up on the Lockett side it was just so painful to watch Ross still cook and still have really high rates in terms of throwing on early downs and throwing over expectation and it not go to Lockett I don't know if you saw anything there in terms of why and then also you know Chris Carson only surprisingly plays but plays well and misses a little bit of time to get checked for concussion comes back and continues to play well talk to me about Tyler Lockett in Seattle yeah I mean I just think it was you know specific to that game um why the targets were so spread out. We talked about going into the game that the targets had not been spread out uh, in the first three games, uh, but it just so happened that, that they were in week four. And so, you know, we paid the price on, on Tyler Lockett um, after his monster game. And I mean, sometimes that'll happen. A guy has a monster game, you know, the defense sells out to stop him and other guys get involved and they were still able to pull, pull off the win, pull off the cover uh, against Miami. The, the, the spread was moving toward, you know, Miami's way uh, the entire week, but the, the Seahawks wound up covering um, winning by eight. Uh, Chris Carson, I think looks great. DK Metcalf is leading the NFL in receiving. I think that they get things back going, including Tyler Lockett on Sunday night against the Vikings. Yeah. They just keep catching these ridiculous matchups, Dallas, Miami, Minnesota, all in a row. I mean, what a life. Okay. Tampa. Uh, unfortunately, OJ Howard was lost for the season due to an Achilles injury. I think people are going to say, well, is this finally Rob Gronkowski's chance? I don't know about that. They still have Cam Brate, man. And Cam Brate, I always thought could play a little bit at this point in his career. Like Cam Brate's not great, but he might be on the same level as Rob Gronkowski as a pass catcher. I think they like the role Gronk is in. I'd also note that LaShawn McCoy uh, got hurt in this game and that's going to give Keyshawn Vaughn a chance. Do expect Leonard Fournette to at least have a chance to play on Thursday night 
against the Bears. But yeah, Ronald Jones looked fine. He did have a few drops, but he got targeted nine times. I mean, it wasn't great, but nine targets was awesome. And so we'll see how much longer he can hold off Leonard Fournette, but it was at least a start for him to play well uh, with Leonard Fournette out and them to get a win. What did you see out of Tampa? Yeah, it's kind of a difficult team to talk about right now because there are a ton of injury situations going on with their skill position players. O.J. Howard, as you mentioned, tore his Achilles out for the season. Um, LaShawn McCoy week to week with an ankle injury. Uh, Leonard Fournette is going to be a game time decision with that ankle injury. Uh, All three of their top remaining three receivers, Mike Evans, Scotty Miller and Justin Watson, we're all uh, listed as DNP. The Bucks didn't actually practice on Monday, but they have to file an injury report. And all three of those guys were DNP, and now they're on a short week um, uh, facing Chicago. So it's there, there are a lot of injury situations here to monitor, but it does look like Ronald Jones is going to have a shot at 20 touches against the Bears. Keyshawn Vaughn gave them something in the passing game uh, last week, and I think that he uh, is, is, is a guy that's going to start to earn a role. Um and then they, they've been playing quite a bit of two tight end sets. So I think that Brait and Gronkowski, well, Brait is going to get the biggest playing time bump by far from OJ Howard. And I think that he'll be an interesting play on, uh, on, on, uh, on showdown uh, on Thursday night. For sure. All right. Last one we're going to do is the Washington football team. And the best thing that we can say is Terry McLaurin went into a tough matchup, caught 10 balls. And we can also say that Antonio Gibson is really separating. I mean, 72% of the running back carries. J.D. McKissick saw a lot of targets, but still Antonio Gibson saw 35% of the running back targets. So there's some optimism there. Did you see anything out of Washington that gives you hope? Yeah, Antonio Gibson definitely gives me hope. I mean, he is a really, really explosive player and he is, you know, learning the offense more and more as each week progresses and his project, his uh, trajectory continues to be upward. Um McLaurin did not practice last Friday, and he was a tough guy to stomach uh, starting against Baltimore, but that was really promising that he was able to do uh, what he did with 10 catches in 118 against the Ravens. Um, uh, you know, the, the Ravens kind of jumped out to a, an early lead, and uh, Dwayne Haskins kind of dinked and dunked uh, the, the rest of the way, but, I mean, that was his career high for passing yards, 314, hopefully something that he can build on uh, going forward, he started slow last year as well and kind of, you know, got it together down the stretch. Hopefully he can continue to, to, to progress and build on that effort. All right. That is going to do it for the NFC team by team pod recapping week four and looking ahead to week five. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. We'll be having plenty more content as we continue to place an emphasis on YouTube and head to the site where you can find everything you need to win at DFS and season-long fantasy football. So for Evan, for Producer Luke, I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.